So thank you all very much for joining this uh, Pushkin House, Pushkin Club event. Um, my name is Rafi Hay, I'm the Program Director at Pushkin House, and I'm delighted to welcome uh, far more people than I can quickly name. Um, but we have the, um, the writers, uh, translators and editors of a new issue of the journal Words Without Borders, um, which is a, a translation journal. Um, and in their February issue, they uh, it's called Russophonia. They, um, they are sh uh, showcasing young uh, contemporary Russian uh, literature, fiction, and I think poetry, um, novellas and other, uh, other forms. Um, and we're delighted to welcome the, the participants in that. And I will make a special mention just before we start of uh, Josie von Zitzewitz. So thank you, Josie, for organizing this and bringing it to us at Pushkin House and um, for uh, marshalling everybody in this quite large uh, panel discussion. So if you, um, if you if, yes, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat and remain muted if you can throughout um, so that we don't uh, distract from the, the uh, presentations. Um, and it, we recommend actually viewing the presentation on speaker view. So it's at the top right of your screen, you'll see a box that says view. And if you click that, there should be an option to turn it into speaker view. Um, oh, you can't, you can't hear me. Um, can, it, can everybody else hear me? Uh, all right, yeah, okay. Uh, it may be just your volume. So um, check the volume, possibly check the um, your mic. That can sometimes just be it, but um, yeah. Um, hopefully, hopefully you'll be able to, to hear everybody all right. So um, without further ado, I'll, I'll hand you over to uh, Josie von Zitzewitz. Thank you, Josie. Thank you very much for having us and thank you so much Pushkin House for having us and I'm at the moment in northern Norway. You can probably see that behind me on my cover and um, I um, it feels very good to be back in London at least virtually. Um, so in the name of everybody who participated in the Yang Rosophonia project, welcome and we are incredibly glad to see you. I'm one of the guest editors of the volume and um, another of my, the other guest editor, Hila Cohen, is also here. And um, if we were present in real life, I would um, point her out. She's sitting over there. We also have Susan Harris here, who is the editorial director of Words Without Borders, and I'm very glad to see her. So Yang Rosophonia is a project that goes beyond the February issue of Words Without Borders, which you may have had a look at. Not everybody who will speak or read tonight is represented in the issue. And not everyone who's had work published in the issue is speaking tonight. And you will hear about topics that are related to, but not based on the Words Without Borders publication. The volume has been a true group effort. And although there is only one example, and I can see Hila has just put the link to the publication in the chat. Um, so there is only one example of collaborative, truly collaborative translation in there. Isaac Wheeler and Riley Costigan, who are not talking tonight. They always work as a team. But everyone involved has edited one or more of the other translators. So we've collectively made each other's texts better. And it is astonishing how much even experienced translators can learn from this kind of collaboration. At the beginning of the project stands the amazing Marianne Schwartz, who is somebody else I would like to um, point out to you and ask her to stand up. Um, she is not only a very highly accomplished translator herself, but she has been tirelessly mentoring emerging translators. And in fact, some of the people here tonight are her former or present mentees. And she's also really good at rallying and encouraging other people. 
She came up with the idea of showcasing in English translation the sheer breadth of Russophone literature today, today, so literature that is being written in the Russian language. All of us involved were already translating authors we like a lot. Um, and between us translators, uh, our work represents a good cross section of what literature in Russian is doing today. Much of it is seldom, if ever, reflected in translation, which tends to favour novels, to fulfil a cliché, or poetry collections by very established poets. But literature in Russian is so much more today. To start with, it, with it's incredibly diverse. So there are many, many genres from flash fiction to protest poetry to novels that mix poetry and prose. And much of it moves on the web. And the internet has opened up many opportunities, just not, uh, just, uh, not just new publication venues and social media as a catalyst, but also new formats, video poetry, pieces that combine different media and poems that directly answer to other poems. The list is endless. Also, Russian language literature today is young, and you will see this um, in the people who are reading today. Many incredibly good writers are very young. And it's also diverse in terms of who is writing in Russian today. And I think academia has cottoned on to this, so I am in most, well, most of the time I'm wearing the hat of an academic, so I'm following these developments. And we have um, coined terms such as Russophonia, global Russian culture. Literature written in Russian today is not just the domain of Russians or people living in Russia. There are those born in the former Soviet republics, people who use Russian as their literary language, potentially their second literary language. There are those who left Russia behind, either as children or adults, and maintain a practice of writing in Russian. They are refugees. They are the children of emigres, often fluent in several languages, who are bringing flavors of another culture into their Russian writing practice. So we've put together a publication and with this event tonight, an event, a round table and a reading to showcase and celebrate this diversity in English. Enjoy. And um, I am handing the word over to Susan Harris, please, who is the editorial director of Words Without Borders. And without her faith in us, it wouldn't have been possible. Thank you. Thank you, Josie. And thank you, uh, Rabia and Pushkin House for hosting us tonight. Thank you all for coming. Um, Words Without Borders is, and as Rabi said, an online uh, literary magazine of international literature in translation into English. We launched in 2003, and today we've published over 2,600 pieces by writers from 139 countries, translated from 125 languages. We're online and free, so we are accessible to anyone in the world who has access to a computer. We're read all over the world in six continent, on six continents. We've still uh, yet to crack uh, Antarctica. We also have an education initiative, Words Without Borders Campus, where we organize our content in units and include contextual pieces to help teachers bring this work to students, which includes a Russian, a Russian unit um, where we'll be incorporating some of the work in this issue in, in future iterations. Um, much of our work is devoted to the discovery and translation of writers from marginalized and underrepresented countries and languages and to helping those writers find audiences in the English language and beyond. When Marion Schwartz first approached me at the ALTA conference in October of 2019 and said she had an idea that she wanted to talk to me about, I thought, oh, I hope this is an issue. And sure enough, it was. And not only was it an issue, but it came to me in such excellent shape that we were able to publish a, perhaps a land speed record. Again, Marian and I had that conversation in October of 2019, and the issue launched in February of 2021. We were absolutely thrilled to bring these eight pieces 
translated from Russian to our readers. All but one but written by women, um, many of whom were making their English language debut in our pages. Again, it was a complete pleasure on our part to work with Josie and Hila and the wonderful translators and authors uh, who contributed to this, to this issue. I'm just delighted that we can celebrate all of you in this event tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much, Susan, for your kind words. Um, we will start our official round table now and our first speakers um, are Hila Cohen, who is going to, well, who is my co-translator and a scholar, um, PhD candidate and translator um, from um, the United States, like most people um, who co collaborated on the translation side. And she is going to interview one of the authors she translated, um, Danara Rasuliva, who was born in Kazan and is now um, um, uh, part of the lively Russian language poetry scene in Berlin, Germany, and writes slam poetry. So um, they will speak Russian, um, so you will have to put up with me translating into English at the same, not at the same time. Dinara and, um, and Hila, please. Thank you, Josie. And it really means the world um, that all of you are here and taking part in this amazing collective project and um, Pushkin House, thank you so much for, for hosting. Honestly, this is a venue that I've looked up to and, and watched for a long time. And it's just like the coolest feeling to, to be in the, the virtual room with everybody. Um, so yeah, let's let's get rolling. Dinara, меня слышно? Да, на русском или на английском будем разговаривать? Кажется, на русском. Да? Да. А Джози будет переводить. Хорошо, я могу на английском. Да? Да, конечно. Если вы хотите на английском, я не против. Мне кажется, так проще будет. Хорошо. Давайте. So, Dinara, it's awesome to see you, as always. And um, one thing that I'm wondering about, I first learned about your work um, through your slam poetry. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about how you started creating slam poetry and reading it and how slam poetry began to be created in Russian in the first place. Hi, everyone. Hi, Hila. Thanks uh, for uh, having me here today and for this um, wonderful event. On the uh, slam poetry, it's a tricky question because I never intended to write slam poetry and um, I never even intended to read <laughs> on slam, uh, on slams, on poetry slams. Um, but when I moved uh, to Berlin six years ago, um, I just um, naturally uh, got to know a lot of people who were involved into this artistic scene of Berlin, literature scene of Russian speaking Berlin. And I was invited uh, to a poetry slam for the first time in my life. And actually I was performing on stage for the first time in my life, uh, like my uh, poems. So it was my very, very first time. And uh, it just felt um, that maybe uh, it worked for me. So I, um, I think I went, second place there and then for two years I went to first place in Berlin in different slams and I really was engaged. Um, uh, in several years after then uh, I started uh, organizing uh, poetry slams in Berlin, also Russian poetry slams and now I am more moving to organizing and taking part in uh, festivals uh, like mostly poetry festivals. Uh, they are very much, uh, very often related to political situation. Uh, so they're Russian speaking and that's why it's um, very often related to uh, what happens in Russian speaking countries. Uh, and um, recently we had several uh, festivals um, devoted to Yulia Tsvetkova uh, and uh, to Sisters Hachaturian. Uh, by the way, there are really good news today uh, about Sisters Hachutran that they uh, were um, confirmed that they were suffering from their uh, father's uh, violence. So we hope that uh, their case will be um, 
result in their favor. So this is, so but coming back to your question, uh, so it was never intended as a slam poetry. So it just turned out that somehow my poetry was fitting into this uh, format of slams, I would say. Could you tell us a little bit more about these very recent events? So um, the Khachaturan sisters case, how it has developed, how you've been involved in it, since it is, um, kind of a, a big occasion today with what's been going on? Yeah, so for several years, uh, we've been organizing um, different events in front of Russian embassy in Berlin. And I think uh, 2019, 2020, uh, they were uh, related to Sisters Khachaturian case, but also overall, uh, domestic violence uh, case in Russia that uh, it was decriminalized uh, and also uh, since 2020 it was related to Yuri Tsutkov. So overall it's about either political prisoners, women political prisoners or um, those who were um, like sisters who ran unfairly uh, 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 put in the jail. So um, we organized poetry readings um, several times. One, uh, once it was um, a festival, Red Square Festival, which was um, one day of which was um, fully dedicated to Yulia Tsvetkova. But several times other than that, it was in front of Russian embassy. It also once it was uh, in um, another scene, which is called Panda Theater. It's also a Russian speaking literary scene in Berlin, very well known. Uh, so mostly there were um, women poets, but also there were uh, musicians uh, who were playing rave music. So we called it a protest rave uh, when uh, before lockdown. <laughs> so uh, once when I organized it um, um, uh, fully on my own, I also invited um, different poets. Uh, at that time, it was possible to come from St. Petersburg. Uh, there is um, a very nice um, poetic musical, um, musical band, techno poetry. So I also invited them uh, to take part in our festival. Yeah, nowadays we, nowadays we uh, have rights to protest here, but not uh, the right to, for example, to gather different um, concerts or shows. Uh, but still we are going to do a very big protest for the upcoming month in uh, in the also next to the um, Russian embassy and it's overall related to our current situation in Russia but uh, my focus there would be again uh, domestic violence LGBT topics uh, in Russia and we will again do our readings so you've given us this picture of how you came into slam poetry, the community that you've become a part of and in which you've become a leader um, through your slam poetry to the point of um, organizing uh, these events uh, for women in, in the post-Soviet space. I'm wondering when you are thinking about the Russophone creative scene in Berlin um, today, what are the more recent developments you've noticed? Um, so in addition to your uh, organizing, for example, for the Khachaturian sisters case, um, who, who is coming to the fore, sort of following in your footsteps, what big projects have brought about a lot of resonance and a lot of discussion, what are the main um, political questions that people are discussing in Russian in Berlin today? Yeah, it's a very interesting question. I think that um... I cannot be sure how uh, it changed throughout these uh, six years, because it could be that I got just more and more involved into some of those and I'm just um, a little bit biased around that. But from uh, what I feel is that um, literary and artistic events become more and more political nowadays. And uh, even one of the um, events I recently took part in was for the 8th of March. 
uh, I did uh, my poetry performance, but overall it was all dedicated uh, to the topic of, um, again, the uh, women rights in Russia and uh, discrimination against women. And uh, usually, uh, like recently, what I noticed is that uh, together with those uh, artistic, uh, literary or musical events um, come different lectures, uh, different uh, conversations on those political topics. So I just see that it's uh, becoming more and more um, common and also people who were for example before only uh involved into political things like um conferences and protests uh they kind of started collaborating with uh artists uh with poets with writers and uh somehow creating uh these fusions so something creating uh, events together uh and it's really interesting uh something that i recently seen Thank you very much, the two of you. Um, so um, now, could I please call now, we'll have a three-person event. Um, we'll have Annie Fisher and Alex Karsavin um, talking to Ilya Danishevsky. Um, and Annie Fisher is a very experienced translator. She teaches translation and interpreting at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. She's also the vice president of the American Literary Translators Association. And um, she and Alex, who is a translator and writer from Chicago and New York, are um, co-translating Ilya Danishevsky's experimental novel, Manoling and Chains. And that's a project that is um, being supported by an amazing, um, an amazing initiative, an amazing academic project from the UK, from the University of Exeter. I think I've seen Dr. Muran Maguire and um, Kathy Mac Dr. Kathy McAteer in the audience. So they have this um, um, large scale academic project into looking into translation of um, Russian literature into English. And um, they're also supporting um, real time translation projects. And it's one of their, it's one of their um, the, the projects that they have decided to support. Ilya Danilovsky is one of the best known literary editors in Russia, and um, he produces um, um, the um, literary features for the online journal Snob, which you might all know. And he was the curator of the literary program at the Wasnysiansky Center in Moscow, and he is also a prolific writer. And he has written an experimental novel that is being translated. And I think they are going to talk about that now. And as far as I understand, um, I am going to be interpreting. So thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that lovely introduction. Um, I will pause now so that Josie can get into her interpreting <laughs> role. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, I'm Annie Fisher. I will, uh, uh, Alex and I will take turns asking questions and I will ask the first question to um, Ilya. Вот, Ilya, как ваша редакторская работа влияет на собственное письмо? Ilya, tell us please, um, how does your um, work as an editor influence your own writing? Это будет длинный вопрос, я, я продолжаю. Ah, вы вы uh, находите темы и вопросы в выбранных вам и авторах, которые потом отражаете в своих работах, или наоборот? Um, do you find topics and questions in the authors that you choose, and are they later reflected in your own work, or does it work the other way around? Uh, есть ли произведения или какие-то части в них, где у вас проявляется диалог или даже диспут с кем-то? Um, do you have um, um, do you have works? Do you have um, texts or parts of text where um, you are engaging in a dialogue or even a dispute with another author? Спасибо. Да, спасибо за вопрос. Я думаю напрямую нет, никакой связи нет и никакого диалога или антагонизма тоже нет, потому что 
типа базово я вообще не особо вижу разницу между написанием слов или заполнением инстаграма фотографиями. То есть это просто разный способ говорить о тех вещах, которые мне интересны. Um, no, I don't think so. So um, no dialogue and no dispute. And um, I um, um, don't see a particular difference between um, writing um, and filling out and um, making posts in Instagram or other media. To me, these are similar. Um, these are just different ways uh, for talking about the things that I find interesting. Ну, то есть это во многом просто вопрос, какая форма здесь сейчас оказывается ближе для того или иного высказывания. So, this is just a question, um, which particular form, which particular genre is at the moment best suited to one particular, to a particular utterance? Mm -hmm. Можно продолжать? Так, по-моему, теперь Алекс. Алекс, вас плохо слышно. Сейчас лучше? А -а. Меня... Алекс, просто говорите громко и медленно. Как слышно? Привет. Да. Простите, пожалуйста. Вопрос о назначении квир-модернизма. Так много всего изменилось за последние десятилетия в русском квир-письме? Um, this is a question about queer modernism. Um, so much has changed um, in the last decade, over the last decade, in um, Russian queer writing. Мы стали свидетелями отхода от экспериментального письма к более экспериментальным литературным формам. Ваше письмо и письмо ваших коллег поощряет фрагментацию, лиминальность, синтактическое остранение и другую одновременность. And um, your own writing and the writing of your colleagues um, is actually encouraging fragmentation, liminality, um, syntactic alienation, and diegetic um, um, simultaneity. Ваш гибридный роман «Манелик в цепях» также явно заимствует Джеймсу Джойсу в общих чертах, заимствуя свою структуру у, у Лиса. Как вы определяете квир-модернизм? Um, and your hybrid novel, Manning um, in Chains, um, is also very clearly borrowing from James Joyce and in general um, is getting its own structure from Ulysses. Um, Miss Ulysses, um, how do you um, define queer modernism? По вашему, какого его объединяющие принципы литературное влияние и что отличает недавнюю волну квир литературы от русскоязычной гей литературы нулевых? So, um, in your view, what are the um, unifying princi principles of queer modernism and what are the literary influences um, on this genre? And what, um, what are the differences between this wave of queer literature from the Russian language gay literature of the early 2000s? I think, in the first place, it has changed сексуальная жизнь России и вообще представление о том, чем является ча частная жизнь. И именно вот это различие, изменение общественного договора между границами частного и государственного как бы влияют на то, как литература начинает говорить об этом. And what has also changed is the idea what um, private life is. Um, so the social contract between um, the social contract that defines the limits between private and public has changed, and this is also having an effect on literature. Динара уже упомянула закон о декриминализации домашнего насилия в России. Но в общем-то это один из ряда законов, отражающих 
современную идеологию. Рядом с ним закон о запрете усыновления российских детей иностранцами, да? закон о запрете гей-пропаганды, криминализации гей-пропаганды и так далее. То есть, мне кажется, то, как изменилась литература, легче всего проследить через то, как менялось российское законодательство. The um, law about the decriminalization of domestic violence and um, of the same ilk are other laws. So, for example, the law that forbids gay propaganda and the law that forbids the um, adoption of Russian children to foreigners. And um, I think that literature goes, um, so they reflect the current ideology, and so literature is in some way following the political cycle. Но при этом я не могу сказать, что есть какие-то объединяющие черты того, что вы называете квир-модернизм, потому что никакого отхода от документальности или исповедальности, никакого отхода от автофикшена, в общем-то, не происходит, и в большинстве случаев скорее наоборот. Um, and on the other hand, I can't actually see any particular defining features of what you call queer modernism, um, because I can't see any departure from documentary um, writing or confessional writing, so I can't see um, a real departure from autofiction. И, в общем-то, даже наоборот, если мы говорим об этих законах, то появилось гораздо больше литературы документально сообщающей нам об опыте тех людей, которые пострадали от этих законов. And when we're talking about um, the um, laws that I've just mentioned, then I can say that we are now seeing far more literature um, that talks about the um, experience of the people who have suffered from these, uh, from this new legislation. Но в моем случае мне было гораздо проще всегда достаточно отстраненно заниматься политическими вопросами и выступать мне как раз как организатор, а не как автор, который обращается к ним. Um, I have had, um, I have been involved in those political questions, but um, more so as an author, uh, more so, so as an organizer than as an author who is um, involved with this, um, with these tendencies. Так, Алекс, я думаю, yeah. номер три, вопрос номер три. Wait, yeah, yeah, prestige, yeah, um, for some reason I thought that was понятно. Тогда я хочу задать вопрос про отношения между современной литературой и литературой 70-х годов. Собственно, я, повествователь Амани Лига, трудно уловимый, скользкий. И вот именно из этого мне хочется сопоставить вашу Амани Лига с неуловимой субъективностью текстов Евгения Ритонова, а также the um the literary the literary eye um of the of the the eye of the um, narrator in Maneling is very hard to put down a slippery um literary um eye and so that um makes me think I want to put him next I want to put your Maneling next to the elusive subjectivity of the texts of um, Yevgeny Kharitonov and even of the queer samizdat of the 1970s. Is there, can you see any links? Наверное, подразумевает, что я должен сказать да, но нет. Харитонова я читал гораздо позже и никакого влияния на себе его не ощущал. Единственное вообще литературное влияние, которое... Я могу буквально в себе тут разглядеть и ощутить, ощутить это, я думаю, текст Эльфрида Эллинок. Um, yes and no. Um, Харитонов I read significantly later, and I can't see that he had any influence on me. If you want to talk about a direct influence, then that would be the text of Эльфрида Эллинок. И гораздо больше вообще на меня влияла музыка, то есть постпанк 80-х в связи, в связи с классической музыкой, да, то, как современное искусство интерпретирует музыку. Во многом mm -hmm. венский акционизм. Mm -hmm. 
and um, in some way I have been much more influenced, much more um, closely influenced by music, so the post-punk of the 1980s and together with classical music and um, how the, um, how contemporary art interprets music and then of course actionist um, art and music. А сама структура письма, его сложность, о которой мы говорим, скорее идет к моему базовому образованию, моему научному интересу, так как я религиовед. И меня во многом очень сильно интересует то, как написаны религиозные тексты. And the complexity you're talking about um, is, um, can be led back to my interest as a scholar. Um, I am a scholar of religion. And um, I am very interested in the way that religious texts are written. Okay. Хорошо, я не я не знаю, сколько у нас осталось времени. Может, на один обширный вопрос? На последний вопрос. Хорошо, хорошо. Тогда, Алекс, четвертый вопрос, наверное, да? Или пятый? Можно любой. Хорошо, хорошо. Тогда... Um, я uh, спрошу вот так. Um, Илья, можно ли говорить о разных волнах русскоязычной литературы, uh, 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 то есть русско русскоязычной гей-литературы, как в феминизме? Или пока нет uh, того, такого четкого разграничения? И вообще, чем, по-вашему, отличается русская квир-волна от англоязычной? Um, can you can we um, talk about different waves of Russian um, of Russian um, queer literature like feminism, um, or can you um, not see any um, any clear differentiation? Um, in your in your opinion, um, how is the current wave, how is the wave of Russian queer literature different from the one in English? Я не замечаю никакой волны российской литературы, в отличие от, собственно, феминистской литературы, и связываю это с тем, что у феминизма и у того, как он отражается в тексте, сегодня есть реальный революционный потенциал, возможно, похожий на то, что было в российской гей-литературе 90-х. I can't see any um, waves of um, queer literature. Um, quite unlike feminist literature, and um, the reason is that today's Russian feminist literature has real revolutionary potential, um, perhaps the same that gay, Russian gay literature had in the 90s. Да, я, как мне кажется, волна объединяется тем, согласны ли те или иные авторы объединяться, да, сращивают ли они свою литературу в некий в некое социальное движение, в некий социальный поток, в единый месседж. Если мы говорим о сегодняшней квер-литературе или гей-литературе, мы говорим просто о конкретных авторах, которые отражают эту тему. И чаще всего в сращении с кем-то другими темами. Um, order to speak of a wave, um, there have to be people who are willing to unite and who are willing to um, unite their literature to fuse it to some kind of social um, movement. We're talking about queer literature today, um, then we're speaking about um, different authors, um, individual authors, who are um, reflecting the situation. Так, это все? Мало? Да, мало, Илья, хотелось бы вас слышать еще еще много. Ну, на самом деле, если я продолжу, там был последний вопрос чем отличается от того, как это происходит на Западе. Но на Западе я тоже не вижу именно волны квир-литературы. Да? Я вижу даже скорее, может быть, некий отход от этого общего к более частному, опять же, в отличие от того, что происходит в мировой феминистской литературе. Wave of queer literature, either um, rather a um, the, the the wave is on the retreat, um, the opposition in well as the opposite of what's happening to feminism. Thank you so much, Ilya. Thank you, um, Annie and Alex, for your questions. And um, oh, uh, uh, Josie, thank you very much for interpreting. That's a really hard job. Thank you very much for doing that for us.
Right, if I go to sleep Lovely. now then. <laughs> um, but I would now um, like to um, call to introduce um, Fiona, Fiona Bell, um, who is, um, is a scholar and translator and um, she has, um, she is going to talk to us about um, becoming a translator, about working with an author who is fluent in English and about the differences, uh, the difficulties um, of translating, of translating science fiction today. So I think I've seen Fiona. Let's hope she's here. Hi everyone. Um, thank you so much for including me in this event. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna talk about how I started out as a translator. Um, and then basically in thinking about that, I, I realized that uh, experimenting with different genres really helped me develop skills that I needed to now work um, with the writer I'm working with now, Tatsyana Zanirovskaya, um, who writes fantasy and science fiction. Um, yeah, so I'm a non-native Russian speaker and I started studying Russian in university. And that's where I also started taking workshop style translation classes. Um, so in those, none of my peers or even my instructors spoke Russian. So the classes were very focused on producing a successful English text rather than an accurate Russian to English translation. Um, and then in my final year of university, I translated a collection of poetry by the contemporary poet, uh, Yelena Isaeva. Um, and I think that for beginning translators, uh, poetry is a great place to start because in translating a poem, you become attuned to syntax, um, lexicon, register, um, rhythm, and sound. And these are all elements that are important in every other genre. Uh, but most importantly, at least for me, um, I felt a, a lot of ownership and satisfaction in translating a single poem, which tend to be shorter than really any other sort of text. Um, so when I was just getting interested in translation, um, I played with very famous poems by like Mandeshtam, Akhmatova, Tsvitaeva, just for pleasure. Um, and that was kind of like a private joy, even though these, these poems had been translated by people who had done an excellent job. Um, so I really recommend that. And I still do that for fun, um, even though I don't translate poetry professionally. Um, so moving beyond poetry, I also ended up entering um, this community of professional literary translators, um, many of whom I met are here. <laughs> um, and that kind of started for me when I um, received the Alta Mentorship um, Program. Uh, so that was in 2018 and Marian Schwartz mentored me for one academic year. And that was really great. Um, I translated a 2017 memoir by a Russian film director, Natalia Mishaninova. Um, and basically when I think back to that experience, uh, Marian kind of, uh, you know, has had a career of experience translating Russian prose. And I, I just remember one example, there were many like this. I was dealing with translating Malchat, so like to be silent. <laughs> um, and Marian said, oh, like Malchat is always, always like kind of a problem. So if you just think about now, <laughs> like how you wanna deal with it in the future, you'll make your life much easier. Um, Cause sometimes we say like, you know, the person was silent or sometimes you don't even have to include it. <laughs> um, like in English, we don't necessarily note that people aren't talking as much. Anyway, she had lots of tips like that um, that probably would have taken me a decade to um, learn. So that was, that was really meaningful. Um, and I also learned how hard um, and rewarding it is to, to get to know a single authorial voice over the span of thousands of words. So in my case, it was a memoir, but the same goes for novels. Um, but to be honest with you, <laughs> um, I translate uh, not full-time, I'm a PhD student. So I don't really have time to be keeping up with all the new publications of Russian novels and long form prose works. Um, and in my opinion, in order to be able to choose exciting uh, long form translation projects, you really have to be reading a ton. Um, and so I got kind of frustrated with that. And I thought to myself, oh, um, you know, academically speaking, I've always been very interested in theater. So why don't I just start um, reading a ton of new Russian plays? Uh, and I was able to do that thanks um, largely 
to the Lyubimovka Festival for young playwrights in Russia. Um, and I think Susan mentioned this, as did Josie. Um, this issue was really interested in hearing not just from Russian, but Russophone uh, young writers. And the Lyubimovka Festival does that as well. So um, it's really for emerging playwrights writing in Russian, but they don't have to be citizens of the Russian Federation. Um, so there's a lot of diversity and those plays are all accessible online. So I just started reading a ton of those. Um, and those introduced me to lots of great plays, which I've translated since. So to beginning translators, I also really recommend looking at that website. Um, I'll post it in the chat after I finish talking. Um, yeah, and just as poetry gave me a certain set of skills, translating plays was such good training in developing character voice um, and also thinking about register. Um, another thing is translating drama is a master class in pace. So it's easy to extend sentences when working from Russian to English, but in theater, slowness can kill the momentum of a scene um, much more palpably. And that's something that um, I especially learned working with Annie Fisher. Um, she mentored me more informally, um, but I really am still grateful for that. Um, anyway, so I'd like to talk a little bit about Tatiana Zamirovska. She's a contemporary Belarusian writer um, living in New York now. Um, so I got to know her <clears throat> from reading a short story she wrote that was published on Bookmate last year. Um, she's the author of three short story collections uh, that were all published in Russia. Um, but recently she's been working on a novel in English. Um, she lives in New York uh, and she completed a new novel about memory and digital immortality. So I'll just say, um, Personally, I've never enjoyed reading science fiction, but for some reason, translating it is so fun. Um, so I translated several of her stories last year. Um, there was one about a virus that makes copies of memories, and this was pre-COVID, so um, she just likes viruses. <laughs> um, there was one about these hunting grounds in an urban apartment basement, a child with aphasia, a reverse parallel universe um, and turkeys who dance. So she's all over the board. Um, and I just wanted to reflect on this. I think that as readers, we take a lot for granted um, and develop a sort of passive understanding of details, um, even in science fiction when we're taking in a whole new world. Um, but I learned that as a translator, you really have to develop an active understanding um, if you're going to recreate these details in another language. So in my experience, the translator must become kind of a logician, finding the most rational answer to linguistic and even physical ambiguities. But in fantasy and science fiction, traditional logic is rarely very useful. Um, so I, I struggled a lot trying to find common sense translation answers in situations when you're dealing with alternate logic, um, you know, like in worlds where there are ghosts. Um, or fictional viruses. You can't just uh, Google and find a scientific answer uh, to your translation questions. Um, so yeah, I think translating science fiction is about learning the particular logic of the world that the author has created. Um, and it's such a pleasure to be able to talk to the creator in these situations. Um, so working with Tatiana was the first time I had such an extensive working relationship with an author I've translated. And I credit this to her being able to be an active commentator on the translation since she's fluent in English. But more importantly, she remains so engaged in the world she's created long after writing them. Um, and she's always happy to discuss the rules of each short story's universe. Um, yeah, I would say that translating her work <clears throat> did push me to research um, <clears throat> DNA replication and plant species and coding terminology. Um, we had a back and forth about the differences between lactic acid and bacteria. And then I learned there's a third thing called lactic acid bacteria. Um, so I, it was an interesting experience for a humanities um, person to both become more literate in scientific issues, but also reject those <laughs> um, in order to create a fantastical world. Um, but Tatiana's work is also very interested in the human and the political. So sometimes when she parodies absurd pseudoscientific bureaucratic jargon, um, the kind we're all probably used to hearing from uh, 
politicians talking about COVID. <laughs> um, it's actually very important that I don't use the correct scientific term, but instead find kind of a jargony uh, misunderstanding. Um, yeah, so I wanna end by just saying that I think as translators, we're all very beaten over the head with the whole accuracy versus fluency spectrum. Um, but I'd like to suggest that there's another accuracy spectrum at play, um, maybe the kind of logical versus absurd spectrum. So while we tend to assume that the logical scientific truth um, is accurate, um, or that we have that our translations have to uh, reflect uh, those ideas, often, and not just in science fiction, Narratives are anything but logical. And in these cases, an accurate translation might mean that language is used in um, wrong or unprecedented sounding ways. Um, we might translate stories in which common sense is no longer relevant. Um, and so language might sound pretty strange. So I think that just as the translators should be able to prioritize fluency sometimes, they should also be willing to abandon common sense, um, enter their author's alternate universe and learn a new sort of logic. And that's what I've learned um, with Zemirovskaya. And I think that learning how to take that leap of faith um, is what allows future readers to do the same and to enjoy her work. So thank you. Thank you very much, Fiona, um, for giving that insight into what it means to work also with an author who can, with a live or with a living author who can comment on your translation. I think we've all had this wonderful experience. Um, to our last round table protagonist, um, who is Kate Young, Catherine Young, um, who is the person who years ago networked me into the American literary translators um, community. And um, Kate is a very experienced person, a poet and a translator, author of two poetry collections. And um, she is today talking um, about um, war poetry um, written by women, women's reaction to the war um, in Ukraine and about, um, and about publication opportunities for Russophone writers. Kate, thank you. Thank you so much, Josie. And thank you everyone for being here tonight. Um, Pushkin House is one of my most favorite places in the world. And it's really nice to be in Pushkin House, at least virtually tonight. Um, so in the introduction that Josie and Hila wrote about to the Words Without Borders issue on Young Russophonia, they talked about the war in Eastern Ukraine as one of the most significant issues that's preoccupying the greater Russophone community. So I'm going to read to, um, a couple of poems tonight from two young Russophone writers, one from Russia, one from Ukraine. And then I'll say just a couple of words about women writing war and also about the particular challenges of being a Russophone writer in today's Ukraine. I'm gonna start with a poem by Russia's Ksenia Yemelyanova. She wrote this poem early in the conflict. Um, and I should say that all the translations I'm reading tonight are mine. This poem is untitled. We're losing our children. We're losing what's most holy our angels, our blessings from God. We're losing them, can't protect them. They go out to play ball and get shredded by shells. They find intriguing contraptions as we found bits of metal, hubcaps. The contraptions explode in their hands as they explore them, heads bowed, contort their pure faces. And we let them out to play ball. Let them wander in fields under fire. There's no sense in keeping them in. These blind weapons don't care where they fall and walls are no protection. We let them out and just perhaps beg, don't pick up bits of metal. We can do no more because we too were raised as meat a natural resource one can kill for effect, show after on the news, regret. And the poet again is Ksenia Yemelyanova of Russia. The next poem I'm going to read is by Ukraine's Iyakiva, who is an actual refugee from the war, which still smolders in her hometown of Donetsk. This poem is also untitled. Is there hot war in the tap? 
Is there Cold War in the tap? How is it that there's absolutely no war? It was promised for after lunch. We saw the announcement with our own eyes. War will arrive at 1400 hours. And it's already three hours without war. Six hours without war. What if there's no war by the time night falls? We can't do laundry without war. Can't make dinner. Can't drink tea plain without war. And it's already eight days without war. We smell bad. Our wives don't want to lie in bed with us. The children have forgotten to smile and complain. Why did we always think we'd never run out of war? Let's start, yes, let's start visiting neighbors to borrow war on the other side of our green park. Start fearing to spill war in the road. Start considering life without war a temporary hardship. In these parts, it's considered unnatural if war doesn't course through the pipes into every house, into every throat. And the poet is Ukraine's Ia Kiva. I have translated a number of women writing about this war, although having even having done that, I'm not really confident in drawing too many generalizations about the war itself or about the work of, of, these, of these writers themselves. I will say that I am really glad that we seem to have moved beyond the idea that all war poetry must be linked to the battlefield. And if you're interested, particularly in following up on the writing of both women and men um, from the Ukrainian side, I really recommend Words for War, New Poems from Ukraine, uh, which is edited by Aksada Maksimchuk and Max Rosachinsky. I will put the link in the comments when I'm done speaking. Uh, it includes the work of 16 poets, eight of them women, and only one of the 16 is an actual soldier. And of course, as you've already heard, Russian women like Ksenia Yemelyanova are also writing with compassion and horror about this war. And I believe we're gonna hear from Galina Rimbu in just a few minutes. I wanna close with a few words about the very complicated situation for Russophone writers like Iyakiva in Ukraine. There are general now legal constraints in which Ukraine's Russophone opera, uh, writers now operate. For example, courses, including those taught by writers, must now be taught in Ukrainian only. There are requirements for public performances, lectures, et cetera, to be done in Ukrainian. Now, of course, many of these writers, including Ia Kiva, are to some degree or, or another bilingual, and Ia herself translates in both directions, and she also translates from Belarusian. Um, in terms of publishing outlets for Russophone literature in Ukraine, apparently the giant Publishers such as Russia's Exmo and Ukraine's Folio publish and sell more or less what they want, no matter what Ukraine's official policy on language is. Raduga, the literary journal formed in Kharkiv in the, in the 1920s, still publishes mostly in Russian. Um, Alexander Kabanov publishes the bilingual journal Show in both Ukrainian and Russian. But remember, most contemporary poetry or a good deal of contemporary poetry is published straight to the internet which bypasses these traditional gatekeepers. So Ukraine's Russophone writers do have options. And I'm gonna give the very last word to Ukrainian publisher, Tatiana Retivova, because she's feeling fairly, fairly philosophical about the current challenges for Russophone writers trying to publish in Ukraine. And she says, I'm not too angry about it. I think it's a temporary situation and perhaps a necessary one, rather like the Me Too and Black Lives, Matters, Black Lives Matter movements in the States. So I'll leave you with that. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Kate. Um, and uh, we are now, um, I'm conscious of the time we're running a bit over because we got chatting, we started a bit later. Um, so we're now um, getting to the um, reading part of our, so to the relaxing part of our evening, to the non-academic part of our evening. And um, actually, yes, we will start with um, Helena Kernan, who is going to read an excerpt from Galina Rimbu's poem, um, Rosa, the Rose. Um, and you might, Pushkin houses, you might remember um, Galina and, and Helena were the first residents of the, they were the residents of the inaugural um, poets, um, poet and translator in residence program at Pushkin House, and they managed to complete that just because before the pandemic hit fully. 
So um, Kalina can't be with us tonight, unfortunately, but Helen, Helena is going to read an excerpt from this poem. And um, that poem is quite long, so she will only read about two pages of seven. Helena. Thanks, Josie. Thank you, Kate. Thanks everyone for being here. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna start and read the first couple of pages from The Rose. There is an island far away where eerie sprites of darkness play. There is no sky that hangs above it, no water around its shores. War is something empty, nauseated soil. Bam, bam, bam. There in the wild, a rusty rose blooms, her scent like clotted blood. In her bud, Yellow snails of heads, red worms of soldiers move slowly. Moths from the houses burst into flames in her bud. She's a riddle of layers, bills on top of banknotes. Her roots, intestines, burble underground. Bursting with realm upon realm, her gut laughs, digesting the district. Her breath is warfare through leaden nostrils. Her petals, human thigh bones. Her roots are lilac throats, there's three. Her kiss are a casket, warfare. Our failure to act right now is an action in itself. Were we born to trample roses like her or to swallow balls of gas? From under the earth, her image emerges seen only by the poor and other blooms watch over her rambling buttercups of border guards, zinc bowls of bluebells. Beside them sleeps the gardener, eyes pasted shut. Shrouded in a cassock, he bowed to an icon before bed. And even in his sleep, in the desire of night and the desire of the rose, he jabs a thorny gunshot wound. Beside him stands a wizened boy, he holds a faceless orb each night he bows to her defenseless with a face full of holes. His inner shrine is fiery, sheltered by a blighted burqa. His heart's in Kurdistan, but in his heart a broken jaw travels back and forth. Lovers still bear roses, Russians in golden chains, in the stench of vapor vestments reduced to dust by radium. He leans towards her, maggots in his temples, and says, remember the ceremonial dawn over the Kremlin. Soon, soon the gardener will wake, the night will be over. She's silent. Her legs are covered with the moss of funeral wreaths, a diamond gas mask round her solid waist. Delirious beetles eat her womb, her pomegranate breasts tremble with agitation. Soon the gardener will wake. He knows the rose is everywhere, but she grows in the light of weeping galaxies. She wipes tears from the sky and from your face, the septic shawl of the lustreless sun. She frees the unshorn animals within us. Thank you, Helena. Thank you very much for sharing that with us. Um, I'm now um, passing the baton on to um, Hila Cohen and Olga Breininger, who can't be with us. And um, so we will hear a bit of um, Olga reading on the video. She has given us a video which um, Rafi will share with us. And then um, Hila will read um, something else, possibly from that same publication. Olga is Hila is my co-editor. You've heard her already. And Olga Breininger is a, um, a PhD candidate, but also um, a writer. And um, she has published a novel, There is No Adoral in the Soviet Union, which has um, won great acclaim in Russia. And we'll hear bits from that now. Я не займу у вас много времени, честное слово. Просто в перерывах между обсуждением украинского вопроса, сирийского вопроса, кавказского вопроса, 
и прочих больших проблем, мне бы хотелось ненадолго завладеть вашим вниманием и кое-что прояснить или, если хотите, предупредить. Мы все знаем, что время клинча супердержав уже прошло, так что пока вы ищете нового общего врага, чтобы центрировать свою геополитику, разрешите объяснить, что ваш новый враг — это я, и ваше новое орудие массового поражения — это тоже я. Поймите меня правильно, когда я говорю «я», я имею в виду нас, то есть тех, кого другие презрительно называют подходящим материалом в условиях глобализации, тех, с горящими глазами и неуемной жажды знаний, кто не постоит за ценой вроде Адерола или Ритолин. Тех, которые с вами будут говорить на вашем языке, потому что знают их пять или семь, а то и десяток. Тех, кто так привык мотаться по свету, что вполне уютно устроиться и в безликом отеле, откуда будет продолжать разрушать ваш устроенный мир с привычными врагами, пока вы не знаете, как с вами бороться. А мы с вами можем любым способом. Потому что для нас после половины глобализации действительно уже все средства хороши. И мы сами за себя. И самое главное нам все равно. Правый или левый, с запада или с востока, нам все одинаково родные, одинаково чужие. И когда вы обвиняете нас в предательстве Родине, это нисколько нас не задевает и не обижает. Это ведь правда? Это вы отняли у нас то, что вы называете своей родиной, и ничего не дали взамен. Так что пока национальные государства борются друг с другом за то, что нам вообще не интересно, нас интересует империи другого плана. Те, где никто не будет говорить нам в лицо, что мы безродные космополиты. Конечно, это я говорю от себя и на своем языке, на том, что я слышала в детстве. Я — продукт экспорта своей уже несуществующей великой державы, в которой единственный я чувствую себя обязанной, и я обещаю отдать долг. Я такой же продукт, как автомат Калашникова или наши великие суицидальные посадили. Вообще-то, если честно, мои товарные характеристики в сумме — это комбинация того и другого. Но представляю себя на мировом рынке как интеллект и продаю себя как мозги. Предмет желания по ту и другую сторону Атлантики, что прекрасно скрывает мой главный потенциал и движущий стимул. Неутолимую жажду разрушения, в которой я и такие, как я, сожжем все, что нам недорого. То есть все. So what you just heard is the beginning of the last chapter of There was no Adderall in the Soviet Union at which point the protagonist, who is kind of an authorial self-insert, has burst into a room of world leaders to tell them, um, in, in Olya's words, we are the sharp-fanged children of globalization. What do you say to that? And to basically say what has been done to her. And what I'm going to read, since you can find um, the full translation of the final chapter on Words Without Borders, and actually um, Alta, the American Literary Translators Association is going to release um, my reading of that very soon, if it hasn't been released already. Um, you can find that publicly. And I would like to share just a snippet of my translation of the first chapter, which is very new um, and is kind of in draft form. It hasn't appeared anywhere. So I hope that you enjoy it. And this is basically the before. This is the protagonist talking about what exactly was done to her for her to become the person you just heard. And specifically, she's talking about an experiment, the experiment of the century. It's pretty satisfying to think that I have made my mark on it all. I've spent hours with monitors attached all over my body and an electrode cap on my head, mortally exhausted, doing interviews with an endless stream of journalists from the States to Germany, to Japan, to Canada, to Russia, to China, to France, to Tanzania, smiling like they taught me to, dispensing phrases that had been specially constructed to make the necessary impression without leaking any details. I took on every assignment with zeal, from a week of sleep deprivation to a general proof of Fermat's last theorem. There was also hypnosis, a strict informational diet, traumatic memory restoration, daily CT scans, and a lot of little wires. After a year, I got so used to the tickling feeling of those wires that I stopped noticing them altogether and found myself able to relax despite it all. I'm completely exhausted after that flight from Boston to Chicago yesterday. 
but three pills of Adderall are enough to get behind the wheel of a rental car, all in the project's done, and make the drive to downtown. Listen, they're playing that old Lana Del Rey song, National Anthem, on the radio. I always smile when I remember how we filmed the music video. Lana was volunteer number 889 on our list, so it was easy for Professor Carlo to line me up as a backup artist. Lana wore a romper with 500 tiny embroidered suns, and I had a big moon attached through my chest like an arrow. We were in love, and just as she pulled me to her with a seductively harsh whisper of money is the anthem of success, I would draw her in with my angelic, as we called it, crooning of I'm your national anthem. All of my guy friends were jealous that I knew exactly how much Lana Del Rey's lips tasted like cherry syrup. She gave me a whole box of her favorite lip gloss. But I actually liked two of our other scenes best. The first one centered on a big map of the world and on me, my arms thrown out like a cross over all of Eurasia, emitting roots that burrowed themselves into the soil with help from a lot of CGI, of course. Still, when we shot that scene, Everything almost happened to me in real life. I felt that I was the earth, that my veins were rivers, and my arteries were black with oil, propelling energy across my limbs, from Central Asia at my left hand fingertips all the way to the Arctic, from the Caucasus to my heart, which pumped out everything that ever happened to me, to the earth, to the people who walk over it, walk over me, and fall back into its depths, becoming it, becoming me. We search for a God above us, I thought, looking up at the artificial sky, but the source of life is really beneath our feet and God is in this earth that allows us to be born in its breast and return to its love in the end. Thank you very much, um, Hela and Olga in absentia. Um, and um, I'm now calling um, Elina Ota and Alain Garbuno. Elina is a writer and translator living in New York, as far as I know, another of Marian Schwartz's um, mentees. And Alain Garbunova is a Russian poet, prose writer, translator, and critic. Um, she has written, uh, she has published five books of poetry and um, has received the Andrei Bielli Prize. And um, I've just heard that Ala is actually here. So I'm very glad to welcome you. Hello. I was very happy to participate in the wonderful issue of Words Without Borders, uh, of Clearance of Poem, uh, Literature in Translation. And great, great thanks for inviting me uh, to this reading in Pushkin House. Um, now I will ask uh, Elena uh, to read her, her translation of um, one of my short story. Um, yeah, hello everyone. Um, thank you so much for being here and for reading. Uh, so I will read a translation of a story from um, a prose collection of olives uh, called Vyashi Ushti. And the, um, the story itself is called Ekperosis and it's also in the Words Without Borders issue um, that I highly recommend to everyone. Can everyone hear me okay? Great, okay, um, great. So this is the translation um, and I hope that you can hear the original at some point too, it's very good. Strings and strands of hair catch fire. Eyes and eyelashes catch fire. It happens this morning, this afternoon, tonight. The fabric of the sky turns from crimson to chrysanthemum. It's not fabric at all, but Flemish lace linen yarn stitched up into the air by golden-haired go to leave in the old city of Bruges. There's a movie about two killers in that town, eternally medieval, with its stone towers and spires, its wooden bridges, chiming clock, town hall, museums, and breweries. And all of this is burning. It's different here. The Petersburg autumn sunset kindled over the Admiralty Wharf, or the early dawn of two celestial bodies at once, the moon and the sun. They're both in the sky at this hour, the moon pouring out its pale green pre-dusk. Over the fields around Polkova Airport, planes descend slowly, blinking their lights, and a young man and woman drive into those fields, go off-road, park, take a blow-up bed and a bottle of wine out of the car. Meanwhile, the sun is already rising, spilling forth the dawn, and the world stands amused by these two luminaries, as though they aren't supposed to be there together, like a divorced couple. The dissolving dawn dissolves distance scatters its rays like a spawning fish, and the world steams in them, weightless. 
The city in the distance steams, the planes in the sky are steaming, the buildings of the observatory and the tall grass, and maybe some butterflies that haven't yet frozen. I love that smell more than anything else. Smoke carried on the wind, coal smoke, in which you'll recognize the combination of every other smell, the scraped knees of childhood, pain and desire, patchouli and oak moss, wormwood and citrus, sand and asphalt, automobile resin, benzene, cut grass and coffee, wine and vanilla, an aching, relentless, irretrievable smell, the smell of everything, the smell of the world ending in fire. Like in disaster films, they'll step out of their cars, they'll leave them behind in the traffic jams and the major and minor avenues, Maybe, following film logic, they'll begin to dance. They'll dance embraced by tongues of flame. They'll spin like dervishes and lash the air with whips of fire. I've heard about a woman from Kiev who's never interested in doing anything, not since she was a child. Not reading, not playing with toys, not thinking, speaking, spending time with other people. Only spinning like a top around her own axis, uh, like a Sufi. So she spun and spun, and then she learned to spin with torches, and she left Kiev, and she went to Goa, and now she spins there. Kiev burns and Goa also burns. Millions of fiery dervishes with burning torches spin around their own axes. Children run out of the schoolhouse and onto the terrace, which is cooler than extended summer vacation. Little whirls of electricity dance by their sides. Each gesture leaves a fiery trace in the air. How slow to ignite are time, space, motion, and matter. Teenagers climb up to the roof to watch the glow of the world. Old man in Dukov, uh, Sick with TB, lisping and mean, goes out on his balcony too to spit at the world one last time. The god comes out precise, crimson with a black center wormhole, like a poppy flower of tobacco and blood. The plains above Pulkova are on fire. The moon burns, so does the nearby Gulf of Finland, as though oil has been spilled into it. Virgin soil burns, the president burns in the Kremlin. Food, that's fire, baby. Water, that's fire, baby. A man with dreads on the Nevsky Prospect sings and drums. Earth is fire, air is fire. On Litani, costume princesses with bare bellies sing and dance, and Sufis in the desert of Palace Square recite poems about the exaltation of the atom. Cell membranes turn to blistering plasma. Cytoplasm turns to flame. LCD displays melt in the running heat. On fire are conjunction, disjunction, implication, the sacrifice of meaning and poetry, the incitements of language, the body, and music. All mirrors break, all images are holy. The waterfalls of worlds are born and burn in the chaotic fluctuations of the universal foam. From now on, there will be no more strong and weak, master and slave, beauty and beast, division of being and reason, word and thing, form and content, thought and sign, holy hierarchy, enlightened monarchy, liberal democracy, or whatever else. Only the waterfalls of the burning world, the cleansing flame, at Thank you. First of all, I have real pleasure um, of announcing the um, of announcing Ksenia Zabudova. Ksenia Zabudova is a poet from St. Petersburg um, who is mostly publishing on social media. She's also had um, two collections out and um, she is the poet I've been translating and we'll just read um, one little poem from the collection Words Without Borders and then um, Ksenia will read one short poem that won't have a translation. And the first one that we will read together is actually tying nicely into the topic of reaction to war, or maybe not. I can start? Hello? <laughs> yes, please. I'm very happy to be here. So I'm starting. Древняя бабья забава. С собой приносить в подоле. Сплетни, запахи, вымысел, нежность, детей. Походи в длинной юбке во мраке и пустоте, Заговоришь о женской нелегкой доле. Нечего принести, кроме тени, выжженной на стене, Кроме письма, пеплом свернувшегося в конверте. Так и ходишь во мгле по коленах смерти, По щиколотку, войне. Bringing home in one's hem, gossip, sense, fiction, tenderness, children. Walk in a long skirt in the darkness and the void, and you'll begin to recount the hard lot of women. Nothing to bring except the shadows scorched into the wall, except the letter curled to ash in its cover. 
And so you walk in the dark up to your knees in death, up to your ankles in war. Thank you. And one more poem. Сколько раз нам безбожно лгали, предостерегая. Достаточно, чтобы ложь навсегда обернулась правдой. Засыпала в одну одна, просыпалась всегда другая. Ты один ничего не знал, не ведал ада. Дело ведь не в том, что под тонкой кожицей все тайны мира и прочее не суразится. Дело в том, что мне этого хочется. А в остальном, Адам, это не то, о чем кажется. Адам, это не то, о чем кажется. Это не то. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ksenia. And um, with this, I um, am very proud to tell you that we have got through our program with exactly five minutes to spare. Um, thank you so much for being here for us as the audience. If anybody has a short question, I am sure um, the writer addressed will be able to answer. So everybody is either stunned into silence, completely in awe or asleep. Um, I just want to, ah, okay, to what group, um, I have just um, heard something, somebody just said, but then lots of people are sending messages, so I've failed to track them. Someone said, to what degree are the writers in this um, issue new to each other? And we have lots of people saying they are in awe, they are not asleep, so I seem to have... Um, <clears throat> <laughs> <laughs> to what degree are we new to each other, guys? Help me. Hila, actually, help me. Um, so the question is about the writers, yes, and also trying to scroll up through the yes. Um, it's writers and translators. I mean, it should be the translators because the writers didn't make the issue, I guess. Well, but it is an interesting, like you saw how um, Ilya and Dinara were um, setting one another and interacting on some of the same issues. Um, the writers who are here, Ia and Ksenia, and Allah can speak a little bit to whether the writers in the, the issue were new to them. But the translators, I think we kind of knew one another loosely, uh, some cases knew each other better, in some cases not, but then Marion brought us all together at Alta. So it's really due to that organization that we ended up running into each other. But I wonder, like, um, um, Allah or um, Ksenia, Вы были знакомы раньше, или когда вы читали вообще этот номер, вы уже были знакомы со всеми писательницами и писателями, которые там были представлены? Пожалуй, я отвечу, да? Я лично не знакома, мне кажется, ни с кем из авторов, кто представлен в сборнике, но читала тексты Аллы, естественно, Галины Рымбу. Но лично с ней... I literally was not um, um, acquainted with any of the writers in the in the um, issue, but I had been reading, like personally, but I had been reading the text from um, Ala Garmunova and Galina Rimbu. We have had, um, I, I wonder, Rafi, whether you want to save the chat, because um, there are loads and loads of um, lovely messages, and then there's also information that people might want to have. Yeah, it will be saved. So okay, cool. Um, when we I'll hand it. over to Rafi. I am done. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you all so much, um, Josie, for for holding the ship together, and to all our uh, readers and our editors, writers, and and uh, um, everyone else. Thank you. Um, I, yeah, I, it's just been an absolutely. Yeah, I'm I'm in awe, um, not asleep. Uh, and uh, it's it's really been um, absolutely astonishing to hear all this new Russian work that, I mean, I uh, obviously am familiar with um, Galina's poem because I'd uh, heard it at, uh, at our um, 
residency last year, but all the other things are new to me. And even even the translation, I think it sounds, sounds better than it was. So I'm uh, really impressed by everything. Um, and I'm, I'm really, uh, absolutely, yeah, I mean, I'm stunned into silence, really. I can't, I can't improve on anything by saying anything about it, so I won't, I won't say anything. But I just thank everybody who's, uh, who's participated and everybody who's attended. Um, it's been a really, really brilliant uh, event. And yes, I'll, um, I'll make sure that all the links that have been provided are, are included in, in the description of the video um, when I send it out. Um, so, so thank you all, um, Hila and Josie especially, but everybody. Um, and I'll see you at our, our next event. So um, keep, keep tabs on the uh, Pushkin House website and our newsletter if you, uh, if you want to be up to date with, with our, next, our next upcoming event. I think the next one that we have planned is going to, well, we've got one uh, on Friday about a new play uh, which is uh, based on a Platonov uh, short story. And after that, it hasn't been put up yet, but we have got uh, in the works uh, Yesenian evening coming up. So um, hope to see you all then. And it's been a real pleasure uh, seeing again all the people who I already know here and meeting for the first time everyone who I haven't met before. So I'll, I'll hopefully see you all again very soon. And um, thank you all again for coming.